They found one of the Jake Cook from one of the Rangers at Ben's old fort. So I've been there for about five years now, but uh, my family lives in Los Angeles. We fell in love with the area. We think this is probably going to be home for us for forever, hopefully. So, uh, you know, my front yard, I can look out and see the Spanish Peaks. I can see where the Santa Fe Trail was down by the river. I can see all these kind of historical things I read about. So it's a neat place to be. So, yeah, that's me. Um, you know, we are a smaller group, so I'll be really informal while I'm going through. Normally, I have questions at the end, but if you have questions when we're going through, I'm, I'm happy to answer those. Just give me a nod or a signal or throw something at me and we'll, we'll answer questions. So I, I talked a little bit, um, you know, the focus of this, we're talking about the military and Ben's Old Fort, and I'm not just gonna focus on the years of the trading post, 1833 to 49. I'm gonna do a little bit before and then a decent amount afterwards too, because um, something I'll bring up, the, the fort, it has a couple different lives. It's not just the fur trade era, and I'll get into that a little bit as we go along there. Um, you know, talking informally with a couple of you ahead of time, over the course of my career, I've been really lucky. I worked at Harper's Ferry, uh, Vicksburg, Andersonville before I came out here. So a lot of those parks that had really good direct military ties, it's not so easy to make that connection at Bent's Fort, but it's there if you look for it. So that's one of the neat things with Bent's. Um, has everybody here been to Bent's Fort fairly recently? Okay, that's one of the big things I usually, with, with groups, we, we have to just talk about the word fort because too many of us have grown up watching Westerns like me, and you hear the word fort and you think of the military right away, but Benz is a little bit unique where it's not a military fort, it's a trading fort, they're there to make money. The military is gonna affect that in a lot of ways as we move along there. So we, we can jump to the next slide if you want. So th this is gonna be talking about before the fort here, and so we have some big military exploratory expeditions coming out west here. So there on the left is uh, somebody you probably heard of, Zebulon Pike. And he's going to come through, come along the Arkansas in 1806. Uh, there's a marker right across from the second site of Fort Lyon, which is supposedly the spot where he first saw Pike speak from. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, on the other, south side of the river there. So right by Fort Lyon? Right across the river, yeah. Wow. Yeah, Very which is cool. neat to go out to if you get the chance. Uh, so yeah, Pike comes right through, uh, supposedly accidentally ends up in Spanish territory. That's up to debate. Uh, I think I'm one of those people that thinks that was by design. But uh, you know, he comes through here, has a peak named after him you're probably all familiar with, uh, and then gets captured. And they're gonna be treated well for the most part uh, he and some of the other leaders are going to be paroled pretty quickly, uh, and while doing so, he gets to travel the length of New Spain, as it was called. It was still under Spain until 1821, uh, so he gets to do all sorts of <clears throat> reconnoitering to see what Spain had and what troops they had and things like that, so it's probably exactly what he was designed to do by getting captured. Uh, the gentleman on the right you may not be as familiar with uh, that's Stephen Long, and he also comes along on an expedition a few years later in 1820, and on his return trip he comes along the Arkansas, mm -hmm. and things go pretty good on his, uh, at least the first half of his journey, towards the end, uh, and he travels right past where Bent's Fort is, uh, but towards the end there, they're surviving off of owls, skunks, and horse meat, and often went for 24 hours without water. Uh, you may not have heard of him before, but you've probably heard his phrase that he's famous for, and he is the one that described this area of the Great Plains as the Great Desert, which of course got, be, got turned into being referred to as the Great American Desert. So, you know, the term today, flyover country, the same mindset there, which, if you look, there's a lot here. So, but a lot of people still don't realize that. So we can jump to the next one there. So August of 1835 is going to mark the arrival of the recently organized United States Dragoons. This is the first real regular army cavalry unit. Uh, when William and Charles Bent first come down the Santa Fe Trail in 1829, 
They're escorted by infantrymen. At that time, there was no cavalry, nobody on horseback, which is kind of crazy to think about traveling across the Great Plains without cavalry. Uh, so the dragoons are the first ones to come across and be organized into that. So they're gonna be part of the Dodge Expedition in 1835, the first big ride of the dragoons out in what we call the Great Plains here. Uh, so one of Dodge's subordinates, Captain Lemuel Ford, is going to describe the appearance of Bent's old fort at the time, saying that Bent St. Vrain and Company were traders with a considerable establishment of goods. These were the first white men we found living in the Indian country in a march of 1,000 miles. They appear to be much of gentlemen. Colonel Dodge with his officers were met by them in a very friendly manner and invited to dine with them. They are forded in with a wall made of clay and appear to be doing good business with Indians, the Cheyennes, Arapahoes, Grovants, with the Comanches. They trade with them to considerable amount in the course of a year. So the dra Dragoons are going to really quickly fall into their role here. I, and while they weren't a common fixture in the vicinity of the fort, I wouldn't call them uncommon either. They're going to be riding along with caravans, making patrols. A couple different years they make a big sweep kind of to ride out and try to show force and show the flag, so to speak. Uh, so they'll pass through a number of times. After Texas gains its independence from Mexico, uh, th there's a few years there where Texas sends, uh, what, raiders, I guess, for the lack of a better term, to raid a lot of the Mexican caravans. There's just as many Mexican-owned caravans going east on the Santa Fe Trail as there are American ones coming west. Mm -hmm. And so for a time there, because Texas claimed all the way over to Santa Fe, and they sent a couple expeditions to try to capture Santa Fe, which failed miserably, but they also sent raiders up to raid Mexican caravans on the Santa Fe Trail, mm -hmm. and there were a couple of occurrences with that where the Dragoons went out and they captured all the men and disarmed them and oh. took them back east, or brawled them, rather, so they were directly involved with that. Uh, just as appropriate with the fort here is going to be, as the Dragoons, is going to be another group, and that's, we talked about that a little bit with the hat you see in here, and that's the, if you, I'll make you say this five times faster, you don't pass, the United States Army Corps of Topographical Engineers. So, um, they're going to come out on a lot more of exploratory expeditions to the west here, uh, most relevant to the Ford are going to be those led by John C. Fremont. On uh, almost all of his five expeditions, he's going to stop at the Ford, either coming or going out west. Uh, the final expedition that he does, excuse me, in 1853, and actually I could kick myself for not including the picture because it's a neat picture. Uh, so it's after Ben's Fort's abandoned, but he has a photographer with him. And the photographer takes a photograph at Big Timbers about where the reservoir is today. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the few photographs I know of that shows Native Americans living their free lifestyle uh, prior to the reservation system being put into place. So that's, I think that's one of like one or two photographs that actually survived from the expeditions. Mm -hmm. uh, makes you wonder what else was captured that they unfortunately lost. Um, so besides John C. Fremont, we owe the reconstruction of the fort to another engineer, Lieutenant James A. Baird. Um, he's recuperating when the Army of the West comes out in 1846 from dysentery. And so while he's there at the fort uh, recuperating, he goes around and makes a series of watercolors, goes with Dr. Hempstead, who's the head clerk of the fort, and takes a series of measurements. And these happen to be rediscovered about the time you know, a century and a half later where they're talking about rebuilding the fort. So just because a officer got sick and was kind of lying around looking for something to do, probably bored, uh, we were able to reconstruct the fort in the way it looks today. So that, that's really important to the fort. So the experiences of men's on these exploratory expeditions, they're really cases of extremes uh, when you read the accounts from the time. They're traveling the mountains, the deserts, and the prairies of the West in all seasons. Uh, facing heat, drought, freezing temperatures, snowfall. Uh, in the winter of 1848, the Fremont expedition that comes through, he tries to prove that you can make it through the mountains in the winter because they're talking about a railroad route. Uh, everybody tells him at the fort when he stops there uh, that, you know, this is not going to work. It should have been a sign when he couldn't get a guide, had trouble getting a guide because all the experiments, 
experienced men say, uh, yeah, you, you might want to rethink this, John. Uh, but he pushes on ahead, and so they lose a number of men trying to get through the mountains. There's accounts of potentially cannibalism that occurs as part of that. So it goes about as bad as you can imagine. So these are the conditions here. Um, one of Fremont's expedition includes some really intense combat with Native Americans in the Pacific Northwest. So again, they're not just coming here to Colorado, but they're going all over what we know as the West today. Um, coincidentally or not, uh, this is another one just like uh, Zebulon Pike. Fremont happens to find himself in California when the Mexican-American War breaks out and the Bear Flag Revolt takes place. And, you know, again, I think that's something, I don't necessarily think that was a coincidence. I think that was a little bit of uh, an instigation as well. So I think that was by design, but they pitch in and they're really important to the fighting there and for better or worse, making that part of the United States. So we can jump on to the next one there. And so that kind of precluded what we're talking about here with the Army of the West. So when the Mexican-American War breaks out, is anybody here from Texas originally? Okay, so I won't make you feel bad. Uh, so it's basically Texas's fault. So when Texas comes into the Union in 1845, for that whole time Texas has been a republic, they argue with Mexico over what the border was, just like I mentioned with those expeditions to capture Santa Fe, but they're also arguing over the boundary. Texas claimed the Rio Grande, uh, Mexico claimed up to the Nueces River, so there was a lot of fighting over this area called the Nueces Strip. And so when Polk becomes president, he, he's very much of an expansionist and wants the country to continue all the way to the Pacific. Uh, whether you agree with him or not, you could argue James K. Polk is the most successful president in U.S. history because everything he says he's going to do, he's going to do. He does it in one term and then he doesn't run again. So, uh, but he kind of orchestrates for the war with Mexico to break out. He puts U.S. Army soldiers right on the border in that contested area, kind of goading Mexico into attack. He knew something was going to happen if he put the troops there. So most of the fighting that occurs when the war breaks out is going to be down on that Texas-Mexico border, and then later on an army is going to land at Veracruz to march to Mexico City. But part of the war takes place here as well, because the Americans wanted Santa Fe, and then of course California as well. So once the war breaks out, uh, Charles Benz are on St. Vrain, are actually on their way back east. They meet with, at the time, Colonel Stephen Watts Carney, soon to be general, and he kind of gives them the latest intelligence. This is what's going on in Santa Fe. This is how many troops are there. Um, this is the route you should take. These are the people you should talk to. So he, he's got just the perfect intelligence, the best people right there, right away. So he brings this force called the Army of the West, and it's gonna consist of his regiment of the 1st United States Dragoons, uh, Alexander Donovan's 1st Missouri Mounted Volunteers. So these are volunteer troops from Missouri. Uh, some infantry volunteers from Missouri, and then a battalion of Missouri volunteer artillery led by Meriwether Lewis Clark, son of William Clark, named after Meriwether Lewis. So uh, this army includes over 1,700 men, uh, has a massive supply train, and an even larger number of wagons of merchants. They've been held up from going down the trail to Santa Fe because a lot of the things they're taking to trade are things like gunpowder, gun flints, weapons, things that they do not want to just gift to the Mexican army waiting for them potentially in Santa Fe. So that's why if you're familiar with Susan McGoffin and her book, the whole reason that she's at Fence Fort when she has that miscarriage is because her husband's freight caravans have been held up and that's the route they went to that. So they actually come down the trail in stages. Uh, Kearney had come down the Santa Fe Trail before. Uh, he knew it was not something advised to do in the middle of summer. So he was smart enough to break his men up into small groups so that they're not using all the water at once, not overgrazing the whole way coming down. So the, that army and all those merchants are gonna spend about two weeks in the vicinity of Bent's Ford. Now that's gonna be the largest gathering of Europeans at Bent's Ford any time in history. Uh, Interestingly, it was not the largest gathering ever to occur at Ben's Fort. Something, probably one of my favorite things about Ben's Fort that nobody knows about hardly. In 1841, we have what's called the Great Peace, and that's when the Cheyenne and the Comanche made peace with each other. Before that, they kind of raided and it had gotten pretty heated. A lot of people had been killed. And so they have a two week process of making peace seven miles downriver 
I think I can probably see the spot from my house. We don't know for sure where it is, but they talk about 10,000 Native Americans on both banks of the Arkansas and these massive horse herds. So that would have definitely dwarfed the Army of the West here, um, but it's still notable. It's the largest gathering of Europeans at Bent's Fort. So they're gonna plunge across the river on August 1st of 1846. They're gonna be led by a group called the Company of Spies, led by William Ben. Uh, you have Jean-Baptiste Charbonneau. I always think that's fascinating. That name sounds familiar. Uh, his father had been the guide for the Lewis and Clark expedition. Of course, his mother was Sagawea. So you have Jean-Baptiste Charbonneau as part of this army, as well as Meriwether Lewis Clark. So I wonder if they ever, somebody thought to get them together to talk, because that probably would have been pretty neat to record what they had to say. Um, this journey as they plunge forward, is going to be really tough on the enlisted soldiers. Uh, one soldier is going to state that parched earth that appeared as though it had not been refreshed by a shower since the days of Noah's flood. So a little different than how it looks right now in this area. Another described the journey in this way, dreary, sultry, desolate, boundless solitude reigned as far as the eye could reach. We suffered much from the heat and thirst and the driven sand which filled our eyes and nostrils and mouths almost suffocation. Many of our animals perished in the desert. So again, this was not a walk in the park. This was a pretty, just getting to where they were going was a struggle for them. We can jump to the next one here. I have a question though. Absolutely. So are these d dragoons? No, so that, I couldn't find a good picture for these groups I was talking about, so. You've got the men here. These are regular army infantrymen. Okay. And I think this is the battle of uh, Chapultepec outside Mexico City when they're trying to capture Mexico City. So the men in the dark blue uniforms, those are the Mexican troops. And then the lighter blue is the regular U.S. Army at the time. Okay. Okay. My question, I think, is what's the difference between cavalry <laughs> and dragoon? Uh, it, it's... Nomenclature, yeah, uh, so Dragoon, you don't have cavalry at the time by name. A Dragoon is supposed to be someone, you know, European armies, they had all sorts of mounted troops. They had Lancers, um, they had Cuirassiers, they had Dragoons, you know, all these different names and they all had specialities. Some were light cavalry, some were heavy cavalry. Dragoons are supposed to get from point A to B on horseback and then dismount and fight on foot. So that's technically what a dragoon is. So they're um, kind of infantrymen on horseback. Somewhat, still more cavalrymen than infantry, but they have the ability to do both. I guess is the they're kind of a hybrid. Mo motorized infantry. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a fair way to put it. Um, once the in the late 1850s, when the army expands, and you have the first and second U.S. cavalry. And then later on, right about at the outbreak of the Civil War, the regular army expands again. And so the 1st and 2nd Dragoons, they're given the designation as the 1st and 2nd U.S. Cavalry. And then the 1st and 2nd Cavalry Regiments that were there in the 1850, they got bumped to the 3rd and 4th Cavalry. So, you know, there's still a 1st United States Cavalry today, and they're the direct descendant of the 1st Dragoons that were out here on the plains. So, thank you. Yeah, no, that was a good question. Uh, yes. So all, all of that suffering that these men are gonna go through on the journey is really gonna pay off. Uh, they actually capture Santa Fe without a fight and things go really good there for them. Charles Bentz made the first American governor of Santa Fe, or excuse me, of New Mexico as a whole. Um, it's so peaceful there that now General Kearney has been promoted he decides to continue on to try to capture California. So he takes most of his dragoons with him. And meanwhile, Alexander Donovan in the first Missouri, he sent off to uh, try to put down the raiding by the Navajo. That was part of the agreement uh, that Kearney told the citizens of New Mexico. You know, Mexico could not protect you from all these Native American raids. We will. Uh, of course, we know the last Indian Wars, as they were called, take place in the Southwest in almost 1890, so it's, it's a very empty promise. But uh, he does send the First Missouri after them, and they're not really successful. So it's quiet enough, the First Missouri is actually gonna go down into Chihuahua. 
So when Kearney arrives in California, he runs into a group, the California Lancers. And just like we talked about with all these European mounted troops, they literally have lances. I think they're like 12 feet long. They're really ridiculously long. Um, so imagine being a dragoon with a saber and a carbine going up against somebody with a lance that long. It's not quite uh, fair. So we like to think about the United States military being really well equipped, uh, able to take on anything. And it's not really the case. There's a big battle at San Pascal in California. There's 75 Lancers that fight Kearney's 150 Dragoons to a standstill. Um, and they essentially forced that group of Dragoons to be what we'd call combat ineffective today. Uh, 18 are killed, 13 are wounded, including Kearney himself. So they still are very important though because they take on the brunt of that fight and that's one of the last big engagements in California. And so with that, the United States captures California during the Mexican-American War, which, jumping a little bit ahead, but uh, to add salt to an open wound, I think it's two days before the uh, treaty is signed, ending the Mexican-American War, is when somebody's building a mill in California and he looks down in the river and finds <laughs> gold nuggets. So, uh, yeah, that's almost immediate, which is just, you got to feel bad for Mexico with that happening right after another. <laughs> um, Donovan's first Missouri after that raid against the Navajo, they're going to move straight south and they're going to be at present day El Paso, Texas, and they're going to win a very lopsided battle there on Christmas Day of 1846, the Battle of El Brasito. He's going to continue south into Chihuahua, and that's what the image there, yeah, I didn't mention that the image on the left is of San Pascal that I mentioned with Kearney. The one on the right is a, it's an artist rendering of what the, this next battle that I'm talking about here in Chihuahua. Um, I'm not a huge fan of that art book, I guess I'll say, but Donovan has a force of 940 men and he faces a Mexican army of 4,000 men. So it's not looking good. Donovan loses nine men killed and wounded. The Mexican forces lose 600 killed and wounded. He completely drives them off of the field. Uh, they capture 40 men. His troops are gonna march all the way onto the coast before their term of service is done. They board boats to go back to New Orleans, head back to Missouri as big heroes. Over the term of their service, they march 3,500 miles. So just an amazing amount of territory they cover. There's a really excellent book called Donovan's March that talks about them, if you're interested in that. So it, while all this is going on, that piece that really propelled these two forces to move on, it, it's not really as, as calm as it appears on the surface. So you have a lot of folks that are in New Mexico at the time. Um, you've got political divisions there, just like any country has political divisions. So you had the conservative faction aligned with the church. They weren't really happy to have the Americans coming down. You had the more liberal faction that liked all the business that was coming in from the Americans. Uh, they're really open to the new American administration. So that faction not really happy. You know, Mexico had only been a country for 25 years when the Mexican-American War breaks out. It was a republic just like the United States. They were very patriotic. And they wait for their chance, and when it comes in January of 1847, they revolt. And when that occurs, Charles Spence is going to be assassinated. Uh, a number of his members of his administration are going to be killed as well. And the American army is going to launch uh, attack up to Taos where it breaks out and fight a number of pitch battles along the way. It's going to be uh, led by Nathaniel Lyon in command of the 2nd Missouri. Some of the U.S. Dragoons are going to be there. And then important events for it surround St. Vrain recruits a group uh, called the Avengers. And it's made up of former Bent St. Vrain employees, uh, friends of the family. And when the final battle occurs at Taos Pueblo, they're the ones cutting off the retreat and they don't take many prisoners, about 75% of the casualties of the um, insurgents, I guess you would call them, that are New Mexican or Pueblos are gonna be killed by the Avengers. And then there's gonna be reprisals and trials, which uh, I definitely would not call a fair trial, trial by a jury of your peers by any means uh, with the uh, executions there in Taos Pueblo. So, 
that's going to have the direct effect on the fort with Charles kind of being the glue that holds the company together. And so that's going to help eventually be the first big, probably nail on the coffin of the company there. So with the increased traffic over the plains as well, you're going to have more tension with uh, plains tribes that are there. You're kind of in this, this golden era. One of my colleagues likes to say when we're talking about Ben's Fort in the 1840s, this isn't the wild, wild west. This is just the wild west. People get along for the most part. Uh, it's not like, you know, when you watch westerns where it seems like there's a fight every five minutes out here. People tried to coexist with each other. Trade was important. But once the army comes out here across the plains, if you put yourself in the shoes of the Native Americans for a minute, you know, first of all, you've got almost 2,000 men with guns coming through your backyard. They're coming with all these supply caravans. The military stores enough supplies at Bent's Fort where they're sending 20 wagons a week down to Santa Fe in the fall of 1846. So you've got all those wagons, all the stock pulling those wagons that are eating all the grass. Um, that's the homeland of the Native Americans as well. They depend on the buffalo that are eating that grass. So that has an effect. And worse yet is something that they bring that they don't realize they're bringing. And that's all these epidemic diseases that are coming out. So I grew up in Ohio, and in my hometown, there's a city park downtown that has a mass grave from one of the cholera epidemics. So it's bad enough back east, but people with European ancestry, they have some built-in immunity to these diseases. They come out here and hit on the plains, smallpox, cholera, measles. Uh, it's devastating. They estimate about half of the Comanche die in the latter part of the 40s and early 50s. The same thing with the Southern Cheyenne. And especially when you talk about the Southern Cheyenne, this isn't just customers at Pencil Fort. William Bent's married into a prominent Cheyenne family. His mother-in-law dies during this period of one of these diseases. So it's not just customers, it's family as well. As a result of that, you know, I like to say when I'm giving my programs at the fort that there may not have been a, a microbiologist among the Comanche at the time, but they could put two and two together and say, you know, this stuff did not happen. These diseases did not kick in until you people came here. So that's when you start to see a lot of the increased rating that we're unfortunately more familiar with occur along the trail. And as the result of that, you have a new battalion of volunteer troops raised in Missouri called the Frontier Battalion or the Indian Battalion, it's called a couple different names, but their commander is Major Gilpin, and if Gilpin sounds familiar, that's going to eventually become the first territorial governor of Colorado in about 12 years. So, um, but they're going to be the first military force raised by the United States government to launch punitive expeditions against the Plains tribes, specifically the Comanche and the Apache. So they come out here, they spend a miserable winter in uh, 1847 and 48. Most of their livestock dies, uh, just have a real tough time. They fight a couple little skirmishes, but that's really the extent of what they're able to accomplish, what they're able to accomplish. But it does turn the page to where the army is actively trying to fight with the Native Americans here. So we can jump to the next one there. So now we're into the 1850s, and one of the neat things with all these pictures and these slides, you see the evolution of the United States military uniforms. There's a lot of changes that occur. And if that's something you're into, study the military in the 1850s. They go through, I think, three or four different uniform designs in a 10-year span, and there's not the infrastructure there to fully implement it at the same time. So you may look at a company of soldiers, and they'll have a mix and match of all four designs. It's, it's wild. Um, but in the 1850s, along our portion of the Santa Fe Trail here in the Arkansas Valley, uh, you've got the 3rd U.S. Infantry coming down here. You've still got the Dagoons, and then you've also got the new 1st and 2nd U.S. Cavalry, like I talked about. In 1857, the Army launches its first real attack against the Cheyenne. The Cheyenne had really fought to be peaceful for a long time until really their patience was run out. And so in 1857 is going to be the Solomon campaign with the uh, first U.S. cavalry uh, fighting against the Cheyenne. And again, this is important. This is the same group that invited the Bents to trade and built the trading post. So the first cavalry comes by and they march right past the site of Bents Old Fort, which has now been abandoned for close to 10 years. 
Uh, there's a, a young lieutenant in that group that gets famous a few years down the road named uh, James Stewart. James Ewell Brown Stewart, Jeb Stewart with the Confederate mm -hmm. Cavalry during the Civil War. Uh, John Sedgwick, who, uh, you know, if you're ever in the military, you don't want to make one of those big, bold statements. He's the one for famous in 1864 and makes the comment that they couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. And literally within about a second of saying that, he gets shot right below the eye. So you've got a lot of these officers in the regular army that are shortly going to become really famous. So uh, you have that Solomon campaign, campaign, and it's the first time the army would fight the Cheyenne. And again, these are the same people that invited the Bents to build Bents Old Fort there. So I think that's important to note. At the same time in the late 1850s, though, you, you've got a lot of different things happening. Uh, the United States was on the verge of war with the Mormons in Utah, so you have a whole army expedition sent uh, uh, for what was called the, the Phony War, the Mormon War. Uh, the, I think one person died of frostbite and that was the only fatality. But again, that kind of becomes a proving ground for a lot of these officers that are going to become famous within a few years back east. Uh, at the same time, and I'm getting ahead of myself again, uh, guerrilla war is breaking out in Kansas because you have the Kansas-Nebraska Act and settlements opened up and they go with the idea of popular sovereignty. Let the people decide if they want to be a slave state or a free state and that turns into a really brutal guerrilla war. And I think that's interesting to talk about here because not a lot of people realize it today, but where we're at now, if you're north of the Arkansas River in eastern, eastern Colorado and east of the Rocky Mountains, this was Kansas at the time. So mm -hmm. technically we're part of what was bleeding Kansas, even though there wasn't a lot of a bleeding going on out here, so to speak. Um, you've got the military involved with that as well. And uh, there, there's one quote that I, I've heard quite a bit, a gentleman there talking about how you had the pro-slavery forces on one side, the free soilers on the other, and Uncle Sam trying to keep the peace in the middle and he couldn't do it. So they're, they're kind of literally in a rock and a hard place there. And Kansas is gonna be a precursor of what's to come. Uh, you could argue the Civil War starts in Kansas. Uh, I think there's a lot of validation in that. So, so how many of you before coming here tonight knew that Colorado troops played a big part in the Civil War? Good, good, yeah. that's a good mix there. Not a lot of people are familiar with that. So when the war breaks out, we can jump to the next slide here. Uh, Colorado men rush to enlist. Uh, they, they form a couple of different free companies before they're organized into regiments. Uh, but they first fight as infantry uh, to repel the Confederate invasion of New Mexico territory. And the idea of being, uh, according to some folks, that the Confederates were gonna try to sweep up, capture Fort Union, which is a huge supply depot, to capture all those military supplies, but then make it up to the gold fields here in Colorado because just a couple of years before this, in 1859, you have 100,000 people come across the plains to Colorado and rapidly populate the state during the Pikes Peak Gold Rush. So uh, the Confederates want access to the gold there, so that launches that whole campaign. And Colorado troops play a big part in stopping that campaign at the Battle of Glorieta. Uh, John Chittington, who of course becomes notorious with Sand Creek, He's a huge hero. He's arguably the man responsible for the Union victory there at the Battle of Glorieta Pass. So, you know, here are one minute and not so well looked upon later on. So things can change quickly. Uh, some of the troops that are involved with that become part of the 2nd Colorado Infantry. Um, after the invasion of New Mexico, they're going to be stationed here at Fort Lyon, pretty close by. Pretty soon, the 2nd Colorado is going to be sent back east. Just to show how the world has changed, one of the first big battles they're in is the Battle of Honey Springs, which is the largest battle ever fought in what's now Oklahoma. And they're fighting with the Union Army there, and at this battle, in their brigade is the 1st Kansas Colored Infantry, so an African American regiment, and then you've got Native American Home Guards loyal to the Union fighting in the brigade as well. So they're in a mixed unit with not just miners from Colorado, but you've got African Americans, you've got Native Americans all fighting for the Union. You know, we've got this big civil war occurring. A lot of people don't realize with what's now Oklahoma, with all the uh, Native Americans that have been removed from the East Oklahoma, they have a civil war amongst themselves. 
you've got pro-unionist, pro-Confederate factions where it got really brutal. So that, that's a whole other story unto itself. Uh, the second Colorado, they quickly get transitioned into cavalry and by 1864 they're operating around Kansas City and their job is guerrilla hunters. That they're fighting all the Confederate guerrillas in Missouri where the Civil War truly gets exceptionally brutal. Uh, so that's going to be their role there. But while the rebellion's going on in the East, that doesn't really ease the conflicts with Native Americans out West. And so as we mentioned, we have the Pikes Peak Gold Rush, you have 100,000 people come to Colorado. That's when tensions really start to heat up with the tribes that are here. Cause like I mentioned, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, excuse me, have tried really hard to maintain good relationships with the folks here. But then you just get to a point where it's not working anymore. So in the meantime, I mentioned way at the beginning that Ben's Fort has a number of lives. So it's abandoned in 1849 as a fur trade post, but after the Pikes Peak Gold Rush, you have all these people out here, they need transportation, uh, they need connections with folks at home. So starting in 1860, Ben's Fort becomes a swing station, a home station for a series of stage lines, which it will be until 1875. And it's also a US post office. So it's probably the most important stage stop on the line, because you know I-25 was not running in an operation then, for better or for worse. So if you're coming out from Missouri on the Santa Fe Trail on a stagecoach, you'd come to Bent's Fort and that's where you'd make your decision whether you were gonna go south to Santa Fe or north up to Denver. And if you were going from Denver to Santa Fe, you'd actually swing down to Bent's Fort and then pick up a stage to go to Santa Fe. So that's where the term swing station is, you swing into that other leg of the line. So it's, uh, you know, it does not look, I'll have a picture here towards the end of the slideshow of what it looked like at the time. It, it's not what it looks like today. Most of the upper level was gone by that point. Um, really, you've got two wings of the fort that are in operation. So you've got the hostilities that are going to increase during the Civil War years, and that's going to come into a head in 1864 with, uh, it's called the Indian War of 1864. And of course, Sand Creek that really kicks that off there. Um, there's four Bent children that are at the village site when that occurs. Uh, William Bent's oldest son, Robert, is actually forced at gunpoint to lead the troops out there. And then his sons, uh, George and Charlie, are in the village. George is wounded, and then his daughter, Julia, is there as well. They all survive. Uh, but George and Charlie, for the next year, they're going to take part in a lot of those retribution raids that occur in the aftermath of the Sand Creek. Uh, Charlie, you know, he's 15, 16 years old when Sand Creek occurs, and he's very lucky. He's saved by some of the New Mexico troops that are there that knew his father, and uh, he, he's kind of handed over some of the soldiers that refused to take part in the massacre. Might even have been inside the Souls Company, but he he becomes very militant. I guess is the right word. There's even an account from his oldest sister where she sees him in the ditch outside. Uh, his father's ranch near Los Animas today. She says, you know, what are you doing? Come inside the house. And she gets it out of him. He was waiting in the ditch for his father to come home because he was going to kill him because he saw him as being aligned with the, the whites. Mm -hmm. So that, that's how militant Charlie got. He was killed by army scouts in Kansas in 1867. So he, he does not have a happy ending. Um, George, on the other hand, he is going to live until 1919. He's going to die as part of the Spanish flu epidemic that occurs in the aftermath of World War I. But he's going to be that first real source for all these ethnologists in the early part of the 20th century studying the Cheyenne culture. So a lot of what we know about the Cheyenne comes from George Ben, uh, who survives this war. And he, he, uh, he, he lives so long and leaves, really, leaves some really neat stories behind. And probably the one most relevant to what we're talking about here. So George and Charlie are back east in St. Louis going to school. Because again, they're, they're in between two worlds. They're half Cheyenne, half Missouri, I guess you'd say, with, with William. Uh, so they're in St. Louis going to school and the Civil War breaks out. And even though their father had been a federal Indian agent in the 1850s and a government official, uh, they try to join the Confederate Army. Charlie's turned away from being too young, but George fights for a couple years uh, in the Confederate Army. And he gets captured, and he's going through St. Louis, and due to family connections, there's a couple possible stories with that, but he gets returned to his father's custody. He doesn't go to a prisoner of war camp, so he's, he's pretty lucky. 
but he comes back out here and you've got Fort Lyon with Union soldiers. He's a former Confederate, he's half Cheyenne. Uh, so that's how he ends up out at Sand Creek. But in the aftermath of that, you have all these raids that occur as the tribes are fleeing to the north into what's now Wyoming. And they sacked Julesburg a couple of times up on the Platte River Road. And so Julesburg at the time had a small military fort and then they had an express office with all this freight coming through. And so the, the ambush that they plan doesn't succeed because some of the younger warriors kind of get ahead of themselves. Uh, otherwise they probably would have trapped the whole force and it wouldn't have ended well for the army. But everybody there retreats into the fort. So they're kind of free to go through the express office as much as they want. And he says, you know, that they're ripping over, open all these government boxes and the warriors are grabbing all this paper and throwing it up in the air. Well, he can read, he can write, he's been to school. He knows what money is. These are the first federal greenbacks, so a precursor to the modern U.S. dollar. Uh, so he talks about them throwing it up in the air, starting fires, he starts grabbing it and stuffing it in his shirt. Um, he also finds a box addressed, a package addressed to a U.S. Army officer, and he opens it up and it's a gorgeous dress coat. So here he is, a former Confederate, uh, now a Cheyenne Raider, and he takes a lot of joy in wearing that officer's coat on these raids after that. <laughs> Uh, eventually, he's going to see that fighting's not the way, or at least in his opinion, it's not. And he's going to work as an interpreter for the government. So mm -hmm. he, he kind of switches over sides, I guess you could say, or becomes neutral, probably at the right time for, for his survival there. So with the end of the Civil War, you've got all these volunteer units that are out here uh, fighting against the Native Americans while the Civil War is going on because they want all the regulars back east. But with the end of the war, that's not a concern anymore. Um, but while the war is going on, they're so short of troops, so the government has to get clever. And they start to think about it, and they've got all these tens of thousands of Confederate prisoners of war. And so they reach out to them, because they know a lot of them aren't, you know, died in the wool Confederates. They may have been drafted or forced into the army. So they make a deal with them that, hey, if you join the United States Army, we won't make you fight against the Confederacy. We're gonna send you out on the frontier. And they recruit over 6,000 of them from prisoner of war camps, six full regiments of infantry. So in our area, we had the 5th United States Volunteer Infantry is what they were designated. Uh, the kind of nickname is Galvanized Yankees, but these are former Confederates that joined the United States Army, kind of get out of a jail free card. Uh, but not free because they go through a lot of miserable experiences out here. But they're going to be the basis of the garrison at Fort Lyon in 1865 and 66. Uh, they're charged with keeping the stage line open. Uh, there probably would have been a few of them at Ben's Fort Station. Uh, maybe a squad or so just to kind of help protect it. So when the rebellion finally ends back east, you have all those regulars come west. So the first big group we're going to have come out here is the 2nd United States Cavalry. So these are regular troopers again. Um, they just got done fighting in the Shenandoah Valley and finished that whole campaign before they come west. And now they're going up against Native Americans, so they're going to have to relearn a lot of lessons again. Um, a portion of them are going to be at Fort Lyon. Uh, in late 1866, a whole company of them up in Wyoming are going to go out. They have an officer that supposedly says he could ride through the Sioux Nation with 80 men, and that results in the Fetterman fight, and he and his 80 men do not make it back, including this whole company of the 2nd Cavalry. So, so again, they, they have to learn a lot of lessons. This is different warfare than fighting against the Confederate Army. Also along with them, we have uh, some really interesting units and in, most of you probably heard the term Buffalo Soldiers. So during the American Civil War, you have over 180,000 men, I believe it is, uh, that are African American that joined the Union Army to fight during the Civil War. And so when the war is over, the regular army carries that over and they recruit the 9th and 10th Cavalry and then the 24th, 25th, 38th, and 41st Infantry that are all African American. And so the 10th Cavalry specifically, they're going to be in a lot of campaigns against the Cheyenne, the Kiowa, the Comanche, the Arapaho, and the Apache in Colorado, Texas, Kansas, New Mexico, and Arizona. So they're going to be in this area. And part of the 10th is actually going to be stationed at Fort Lyon for a couple of years. Uh, unfortunately, in March of 1869, some of them are going to be in a theater. 
and there's going to be some of the white soldiers from the garrison too and a fight breaks out and the government decides well we're going to send these troopers away so the buffalo soldiers are sent away because of that incident um so th th there's a racial divide there and it's not a pleasant thing to talk about but at the same time you know the economy of having these military posts there these are men that are helping out the industry helping the commerce of these small communities out west not to mention the protection that they bring they were really respected as soldiers so um, they do gain a lot of respect even though there is some resentment there at times so the professionals are back guarding the trails and like i said they've got a huge learning curve it takes about 30 years for what we refer to today as the Indian Wars to come to a close. And so within the end of that 30 years, you've got people that have lived here for hundreds of years that are suddenly not here anymore. They're, you know, the people that are here, they're now in Oklahoma, they're in Wyoming, they're in Southern Montana on reservations. So it really drastically changes the way of life and the people that are here. But with the focus being on the military here, what ties all these different groups together? You know, we started out um, all the way back with the uh, Zebulon Pike in 1806, and now we're into the 1880s and 90s. So I mentioned before the changes in the uniforms. They're wearing different uniforms, but they're all members of the United States military. So some are regular, some are volunteers, some walked, some rode, some just made maps, but they're all volunteers and they just like today they chose to serve for one reason or another they experienced blizzards and heat uh, somebody asked I think you asked about was that uniform year-round yeah, that's your year-round uniform it's not till the very end of the uh, wars with the Native Americans where they start to adapt what we'd call Arctic gear today for the, the nasty wizard blizzards that we get here but you have men die of hypothermia and heat stroke stampeding buffalo, rattlesnakes, blizzards, drowning. I haven't even talked about combat yet. Uh, the troops out here are extremely isolated, especially early on. So something to keep in mind, uh, somebody that I work with mentioned it to me, it just blew my mind and I, I stole it because it's really good. More people live today in Lahana than there were European Europeans living north of the Arkansas and west of the Mississippi at the time Bent's Fort was in operation. There's more people in Lahana today. So it kind of puts in perspective how small these communities were. Uh, it's commonly said that warfare is 99% boredom and 1% sheer terror, and I think most of these men would have agreed with you. Um, just getting used to the climate. I, I know my wife's from East Tennessee in the hills. Uh, there's trees everywhere, and it was a little bit of an adjustment moving out here into the plains. You know, I grew up in northern Ohio, farm country. I love wide open areas. Um, it was an adjustment for her. She loves it now, but, you know, again, imagine being out here in the 1860s and how drastic that switch would have been. You would have felt like you were on the far side of the moon, probably. So that 1% of sheer terror, jumping back to that, that's probably what people think the most of when they think about military history and the troops that are out here. So there's a really good book that I read last year and it's called Marching Home Union Veterans and Their Unending Civil War. And so it talks about veterans of the Union Army following the Civil War. And so talking about those soldiers and the physical scars, it's got a quote, empty sleeves people to living republic of suffering in post-Civil War America. And this is referring to men that had lost a, a limb due to amputation. In our streets, in our offices, on our farms, everywhere we meet empty sleeves. The soldier's friend remarked soon after the war. Sleeves that the wind blows against broken ribs, whips about crippled bodies, sleeves whose emptiness tells of arms blown off in battle, of arms lost in strife for the life of the nation, of arms shattered with the flag in hand. On the town green in nearly every northern village, it seemed, one encountered limbless and armless veterans, ruined in health and dependent on their friends for sympathy and the comforts of life. So these are the survivors and they have scars to show it. But then you've also got the people that don't have the scars to show it. And you know, again, today we're pretty aware of post-traumatic stress disorder and uh, they just didn't really know what it was at the time or why people may have acted differently when they came home from warfare. And the book talked about that as well. And it said, these old soldiers live somewhere between the past and the present, between the dead and the living, between innocence and guilt. 
Because of this liminal existence, no one, save another comrade, could ever truly know a Union veteran. He lived as an enigma, an impossible riddle, casting a long and unwelcome shadow over a generation of Americans who were ideologically unprepared for the horrific consequences of the Civil War. And again, that's focusing on the Civil War, but I think it fits really well with the experience here on the frontier. You know, I've often thought and mentioned a couple times, I think the reason you have the wild, wild west post-Civil War is you have all these men that were trying to deal with what they went through back east. Uh, you know, you have, I think, the latest estimates, well over 600,000 men killed. That's 6% of the population at the time in the United States that's killed during the Civil War as a result of combat wounds or disease or... So it's something really hard to grasp. And, you know, as long as humans have walked the earth, there's been warfare. It's not going away. If you just turn on the news today, there's warfare in Africa and Asia. We have the first land war in Europe since World War II going on full tilt right now, and it doesn't look like it's stopping anytime soon. So I don't think it's any coincidence that you don't see that here. And we also have the largest all-volunteer force, the United States military, in the world. So I think there's a correlation there. Uh, just like the men I mentioned earlier that passed by Bent's Fort, the men and women who serve the country today, that they all deserve our respect because they're volunteering to do what they do. And so with that, I'll conclude for the evening. One couple things I'll mention, I want to put some plugs in for some programs we have. So coming up on July 4th, uh, we're going to have our old-fashioned 4th program in the afternoon from 1 to 3.30, and there's that little description that we have there. Uh, actually, if you want to jump one more slide. Um, oh, I, I missed a bunch of them. I'm sorry. I got so into what I was talking about. So that's okay. the original Fort Line on the left and new Fort Line on the right. <laughs> and then, yeah, so the old-fashioned 4th of July. Uh, part of that, we actually have a drawing, and you can, if you win the drawing, you take home a period flag that's flown over Ben's Fort, which is kind of neat. And then if we can jump to the next one, the weekend after Labor Day, uh, we're going to present a vet, an event called The Second Life of Ben's Old Ford. And that's going to talk about that stagecoach era. We haven't really done a big event focusing on that. Um, I've already got 71 volunteers signed up for that. We'll probably have close to 90 with all the military representations. But that's going to be set in 1865, mm -hmm. where we're going to have the stagecoach company employees. We're going to have stagecoach passengers. Uh, the second U.S. Cavalry I mentioned, people portraying them. So mounted cavalry, we're going to have people portraying these galvanized Yankees. Uh, buffalo hunters, we're, we're going to have part of the Sand Creek Investigative Committee sent out by Congress to find out what happened. And so we're going to have folks portraying that. And that's actually going to be one of our programs is one of those interviews they do of witnesses. So uh, that's the weekend after Labor Day. That'll be probably our biggest event of the year, but that's a really unique one that we haven't really touched on that before. So, so is this an etching or is this a photo? That's a drawing, but that's that's what the fort would have looked like roughly at that time in 1865. Yeah. And we know, uh, if you're familiar with the fort, the billiards room, I think it's the winter of 1863, that billiards table is chopped up for firewood. I think the winter of 1864, which again, you, you kind of, that sounds like, just an obscure fact, but if you think about it, the winter of 1864, Sand Creek was late November of 1864, and the reprisals were immediate because you had a lot of understandably very upset Native Americans that were doing a lot of raiding as the result of kind of the retribution of Sand Creek. So if you have the option, you need to stay warm, well, I don't want to go outside of the fort and try to get firewood. Here's this billiards table that nobody here even plays billiards, and I don't know, but it's perfectly good wood to burn. Uh, so that may be the, the story behind that. I don't know. I'm surmising a little bit. But yeah, when William Bent abandons the fort, he, he partially destroys it. We don't know how complete that destruction was. It nobody does not burn very well. Um, but we know by the time it's a stagecoach operation there, it's just one level and really only two wings are usable as rooms. So that's, that's a rendition of what it would have looked like. So pretty rundown. Yeah. So you were talking about the Avengers. Yes. In the first part of your lecture. Um, 
What, what was Kit Carson's? He, he's not there at the time, so he, um, you know, and, and this, this is kind of a fun story, and you, you gotta feel bad for him. Um, so he's out with Fremont when the war breaks out, so the Bear Flag Revolt, all of that that's going on. He's set with dispatches coming east, and he's excited because he wants to set the record for a continental trip to go all the way to Washington, D.C. He's got dispatches for the president that, you know, this is what's going on in California. Well, he's coming on that southern route, and who does he run into but Kearney going west? And Kearney says, well, you know what? I didn't need an experienced guide. You just came over this road. Sorry, but you're coming with us. And of course, he hadn't seen his wife, I think, in a year and a half by that point. So he was probably excited to stop off and see his wife in northern New Mexico. Um, but and I'm going blank on the gentleman with him. But the other guy with him is the one that got to make that big continental trip all the way back. Carson had to turn around and go with Kearney. So he's at San Pasquale. And, He's one of a few men that volunteer to escape and get help when they're kind of trapped and combat ineffective there in the aftermath of that battle mm -hmm. and goes through lava beds barefoot, loses his shoes, and just this really rough ordeal uh, to get help to come and kind of rescue Kearney. So yeah, Carson's not a part of that. Um, he is, he becomes a uh, colonel of the New Mexico Volunteers during the Civil War though and is in the Union Army. Uh, launches the campaign against the Navajo, the defeat the Navajo, uh, fights at the first battle of Adobe Walls down in Texas, which was a former Ben St. Bain, Brain and Company training post. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of folks that are Navajo are not big fans of Kit Carson, but on the opposite side of the coin, uh, he's one of the first people to condemn Sand Creek. And when you have the treaty and the aftermath of that, the treaty of the Little Arkansas, the Shine and Arapaho request him and William Bent to represent them. So, you know, I think that's important with these historical figures. You can really pick on them for one thing or another, but you gotta look with the good with the bad too. So I, I wouldn't want somebody to kind of go with a, a fine tooth comb through my life. I'm sure there's stuff <laughs> I've done that I'm not super proud of, but yeah. And I think that's what makes history interesting people are people human sure. beings you've got history words and all so yeah that Shivington point was a good point because everyone associates Sand Creek with Shivington but you know Gloria Pass he was he was a hero yeah well what he does at Glorietta the Confederates are winning that battle and he kind of finds a way around to get in the rear he completely destroys all the Confederate supplies so they have nothing left uh, and they essentially all have to walk back to Texas, the ones that make it, the ones that are captured. Um, and that's all the result of Shivington. So again, and by no means am I saying he's a great guy, because he was, even you read about him before the Civil War, he, he's, he's not a really great person. Um, Wasn't he a Methodist minister? He was. Um, yeah, I, I find it's hard to find anybody to really say much good about him um, before or after the war. Um, but yeah, you can't argue that he's the one responsible for winning the battle of Gloria Pass. Mm -hmm. um, so. Now, where that is uh, the first thing you uh, talked about, where Pike they think yes. first saw Pike's Peak, because mm -hmm. I'm going to ride my bike out there. So the I want to go by where you think that is. That's fascinating. It's it's a haul yeah. to get out there. Excuse me. Um, it's a haul to get out there. There's, if you go past Boggsville, right, and you go across the Purgatory River, and there's that first left turn, and you're, you're in farm country, you follow those roads back, and you're right next to the railroad tracks. You gotta go, gosh, it's gotta be seven or eight miles, I think, but you end up right across from New Fort Line, current Fort Line, I guess you should call it. Um, but oh. there's one of the underpasses that goes under the railroad tracks and goes out to where the monument is. Oh, so there is a monument that, that mm -hmm. commemorates where they think he first saw Pike's Peak. Yes. Yeah. What's, oh. that, what's that thing in uh, Lamar? That's one of his campsites. Oh, just, yeah, I, I don't they call think it they... They tower or something. Yeah, I don't... I, I, my guess would be they built the tower that back when it was clear before you had all the smog with, from the top of the tower you might be able to see it. I don't know. <laughs> Um, 
And I don't know if you could see it from that spot today, but when I drive to work every day, that county line hill between Bent County and Otero County on 194, especially in the winter time, I mean, you can see from Pikes Peak all the way down to the center. Oh, yeah. Christmas, it's gorgeous. So yes. I, I believe it that he could see it from that spot at that time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah clear. But um, what you described, that's coming like from the south. What about like if you're just on 50 by Fort Lyon? Um, you know, I, I, there's a little bit of rise of a rise on that south bank, so I think that makes it a little more possible. But how do, uh, is there a map to go to that I don't monument? I think or? so. I had somebody just kind of point it out and tell me that it was there. Huh. Is it off like uh, county roads, like you said, or by the railroad, you said? It's right, it's on the north side of the railroad, so you have to go under the railroad to get to it. Um, now, is that on the Keller land track? I think that that's where that's at. What's that, the Keller? It's this? a state wildlife land track. It's real close to oh. the, you, you yeah, pass the I've been there before. The if you go to the south. museum in Los Animas yeah. and talk to Kathleen, Okay. She has a photograph of a gentleman reenact and dressed as Zebulon Pike next to the monument. You can see a picture of it. It looks like a large rock out yeah. in the middle of a field, but it's <laughs> over by the river. Yeah. Um, and I believe it's adjacent to the Keller Land Tract. And you can find an article in Photo Gallery on my website. Okay, and then Ka Kathleen would know. Mm -hmm. At the museum in Los Animas, yes, she would. She'd be able to drive you. That'd be the Bent County Historical Society that put the marker up. Well, yeah. I and that's what she's associated down. with. Yep. Yeah. And it's neat going out that there's actually an elk herd out there. Yeah, I think it'd be. It's really cool. I'd Kelly love Rock to, is really a neat spot. I'd love to go out there. My wife was like, "Don't give away my fishing spot." <laughs> <laughs> well, Rob was coming. Yes, we just did. Right? Yeah. Good job. <laughs> Well, Rob was filling me in a little bit on Fort Lyon, but that's another fascinating facility. I mean, listening to you, I mean, that was a real military base. Oh, definitely. Until, yeah. what, about 1880s? Somewhere in there. 1889. When did that convert from military oh, to hospital? It's somewhere. I don't know if it makes 1890, but it switches to a naval tuberculosis hospital. Mm -hmm. And then I don't really know the... Completely. You know, I looked when I came out here that it's one of the few Western forts that there's not a book on. A what? There's not a book on it. It's one of the few Western forts oh, really? that nobody's written a book on it. So, um, The shield says in 1930 that there was a tuberculosis for the Navy. I think it starts before then. I think it yeah. does too, but I think the oh, yeah. says Actually, fact, I know it is during World War One because I forget. Oh, somebody yeah. Somebody told me, one of our volunteers mentioned it, I think, that there's actually a German POW from World War One buried in the National Cemetery there because he was sent there because he contracted tuberculosis as a POW and died while he was there. So. Oh, yeah, and you see, there's a big plaque, uh, 1906. That sounds right. Um, I think it's been a hospital... I mean, uh, I just, I don't know for sure. I had the impression after I last, I, I uh, left there last weekend, it was like the late 19th century. And then it was like stages, it just kept building up. I think so. And then, yeah, the Navy had, uh, it was the Navy and the Army uh, rehab. And, um, but no, that's a, that's a very interesting site. I mean, that's from, you know, that was military until, um, as you were describing, that would have been like um, after the Civil War, what was it, the first Colorado, they ended up, they stayed at Fort Lyon? But they're at the first Fort Lyon, so where Ben's new fort was, east of John Martin Reservoir. So, um, well, they have a fort, of, and you can still kind of see the Star Fort up around where Ben's new fort was, and they use that stone building as the quartermaster. But the barracks and things from the, uh, the picture I had up there, that's in that low swale, and so it was just miserable. It flooded all the time. And yeah. so post-Civil War, Sherman's not the general in command of the entire army. He's just in charge of the department that 
composes this area. So he goes on a big inspection tour in 1866, I believe. And he, while he's there, he sees that the fort's flooded and you have these galvanized Yankees that are still there. He, he says, you know, for one, these guys have done enough. We, we need regulars out here. Let's muster yeah. out all the volunteer troops. But he says, you know, this place needs to be moved. So it gets moved to where the present site of Fort Lyon is. 